if we want to give a real shot to Global South country to build the productive capacities to meet the needs of their population and also to adapt uh, to the consequences of global warming, for example, we need to liberate resources. And where are we using resources today? Well, merely we're using them in richest regions of the world. The true sustainable development is a development with two speeds. Degrowth for the rich regions of the world that will have to produce and consume less in order to create the possibility for sustainable production and consumption in the global south. Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your co-host, Mike DiGirolamo. And I'm your co-host, Rachel Donald. Bring you weekly conversations with experts, authors, scientists, and activists working on the front lines of conservation, shining a light on some of the most pressing issues facing our planet, and holding people in power to account. This podcast is edited on Gadigal land. Today's guest in the newscast is economist and researcher at Lund University, Timothée Parikh. He speaks with co-host Rachel Donald about a concept some 20 years old called degrowth, what it is exactly, and why he says it is a way for a truly sustainable development pathway for our global economy, diverging from the ecological stress of the current endless growth economic mindset. The term is arguably misunderstood by some high-profile scientists. Last time on the newscast, we hosted data scientist Hannah Ritchie, who in her new book, Not the End of the World, criticized degrowth, saying it won't fix our problems and that a world with degrowth would be, quote unquote, even worse. But not all experts agree. Patik clearly defines what degrowth is and what it isn't, and why some economies, such as the United States, are actually currently wasting trillions of dollars that could be diverted to quality of life improvements. It's a very informative discussion, and I hope you enjoy it. Tim, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hello. Very well. What about you? Good. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm very looking, much looking forward to this conversation. Degrowth isn't something that's been covered a lot on Mongo Bay. So we've got a lot to cover in the short time that we have. Let's get to it. Could you give a brief overview of uh, degrowth and degrowth in relation to our current economic system? Okay, so degrowth is a French concept. It comes from originally, it emerged in 2002 as décroissance soutenable et conviviale. So sustainable and convivial degrowth. That was the original concept from 2002. And back then, people were just trying to think critically about sustainable development, and especially the fact that sustainable development as was integrating the notion of just infinite growth. So sustainable development in the global north was the very same as sustainable development in the global south, and we would expect all these countries to kind of forever produce and consume more. These people, they coined the term degrowth, building, of course, on other growth critical theories like the limits to growth of the 1970s to argue if we want to give a real shot to global south country to build the productive capacities to meet the needs of their population and also to adapt uh, to the consequences of global warming for example we need to liberate resources and where are we using resources today well merely we're using them in richest regions of the world. So basically they were trying to refine the concept to be like, the true sustainable development is a development with two speeds. Degrowth for the rich regions of the world that will have to produce and consume less in order to create the possibility for sustainable production and consumption in the global south. So. From 2002 to 2008, it was merely discussed in Italy, in Catalonia, in Spain, in France, a bit in Quebec. But then there was the first international conference in Paris in 2008. The concept was translated in English, and then it became a whole field of scholarship. Now it's quite big. There is more than a thousand peer-reviewed articles on the topic of limits to growth, degrowth, post-growth steady state economics, donut theory, 
all kind of voluntary simplicity, alternative hedonism, minimalism, eco-socialism. So all these kind of concepts that are part of these kind of growth critical constellation. Maybe just to frame the debate, I'm, I'm going to give one definition of the term, and then I'm going to articulate this definition to another term, which is the one of post-growth. So degrowth, the way I theorize it in my work, is a downscaling of production and consumption to reduce ecological footprints. So it's basically a macroeconomic diet for high-income countries that do, do not manage right now to reduce their ecological footprint. So if they cannot do this while producing and consuming more, or even while maintaining their current levels of production and consumption, then they must somehow find a way of producing and consuming less. But then in the definition I add, a downscaling of production and consumption to reduce ecological footprints, planned democratically in a way that is equitable and for the sake of improving well-being. So here we're still understanding degrowth as a temporary, selective, macroeconomic diet, but it is designed so it's not like the contraction you would have during a recession, which really looks like more of an amputation. It's more like a diet where you decide, okay, what sector is going to decrease? How do we stabilize? How do we create, do we create safety nets for workers, for consumers, for municipalities, for national budgets, so that we can keep prosper without growth, as Tim Jackson say. So that's how I personally theorize degrowth, and I think that vision is pretty much democratized, consensual within the degrowth field today. And then we can articulate this transition, the macroeconomic diet, degrowth with a broader concept, which is post-growth. And post-growth refer to what Canadian economist Peter Victor called management, like managing without growth, or Tim Jackson called prosperity without growth, or Juliet Shore called plenitude, or Art Mutrosa called resonance. All these concepts kind of trying to look at Okay, once we've done the diet, what is a healthy economy? A healthy economy that can both satisfy needs, so it can be prosperous in social terms, but also remain sustainable. So without, we, we would say without overshooting the carrying capacities of ecosystems, we can look at planetary boundaries or any other kind of indicators like ecological footprint, but you want your economy to remain in a steady state, as Armand Daly was saying already in the 1970s. So here we can divide that mode of thinking into degrowth transition question, post-growth destination question. Wow. What a phenomenal introduction and lots of places that we can shoot off from. Thank you, Tim. The first thing that I want to touch on is if degrowth is downscaling production and consumption, this macroeconomic diet for rich countries, there are some economists and certainly a lot of politicians that claim that we can decouple our production, our consumption from our emissions, i.e. that we will continue to grow infinitely our economies whilst decreasing our impact on the planet. Why is that a load of nonsense? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think they're wrong. And you know what it reminds me of is like, reminds me of me when I was a kid and the first time I tried to solve a Rubik's Cube and I kind of like <laughs> solved one face, you know, one color and I was like, look, I finished the Rubik's Cube. And, you know, in the same way that these neoclassical economists and politicians, they're like, look, we've managed to reduce carbon emissions. And, <laughs> and you, I mean, if you're a sustainability scientist, you're like, guys, you know, we call them planetary boundaries in the plural for a reason. Like the ecological transition is Rubik's cubes with many colors. What makes it difficult is that you have to solve them all at once, especially these colors, they're shared colors between different countries. So if the UK managed to slightly decrease its carbon emissions, it cannot call this growth green or sustainable. That will be a sham of actually what uh, a sustainable economy needs to be. So to these people, I tell them, okay, if you want to show, if you want to prove that we can keep producing and consuming, that what growth is, while being sustainable, you need to show that we can decouple economic growth from all environmental pressures, extraction of metals, biomass, materials, water, fossil fuel, emissions of greenhouse gases, degradation of soil fertility, land use change, biodiversity loss, production of e-waste, production of air pollution, all these stuff that are today pushing us in the ecological red, 
you have to show that you can bring them back in the green. And of course, you need to do this while taking into account these environmental pressure wherever they happen. Because there are too often politicians that are like, look in France, we've green growth. I'm like, you've not green growth. You've basically, you've been delocalizing. You've been moving to other countries, the almost pollutive industries. And now you're just using iPhones and computers that China is producing. And you're like, oh, the Chinese emissions are just enormous, which is a bit like, <laughs> no, that's called, you know, imported emissions. And that's 56% of the French carbon footprint today. So more than half. So if you can show that you can decouple GDP growth from all these pressures, wherever they happen, and you can do this not only for a small period of time, which often countries do actually when they experience a recession, like they did during the pandemic or during the financial crisis, which is quite funny because the kind of green growth that people kind of celebrate, it's a green growth that has been mostly driven by economic contraction. So that's where I'm like, okay, guys, I mean, that's the very <laughs> definition of green growth is... And so, and you need to do this sufficiently fast. And I think that's the most difficult because for certain environmental pressures, we're not even starting to do it. That can be material footprint. It's very difficult to lower like the mass of uh, biomass, uh, metals, minerals, and fossil fuel that you extract from the ground. Very difficult to reduce, especially materials. It's easier actually to decrease greenhouse gases because you just need to stop using fossil fuels and use alternative use of uh, like forms of energy, which is like, one of the easiest thing you could do. Even that, we're not doing this sufficiently. Like the, the, only the only 11 countries in the world that have experienced these kind of supposedly uh, low carbon growth, so GDP up and just uh, greenhouse gases down, they've done so at a speed that is so minuscule, so tiny, that actually doesn't make you green, makes you just relatively a tiny bit kind of greener than what you used to be before. And this doesn't include any equity consideration. So again, if you put these quote-unquote achievements with the framework that shows you basically the splitting of the global carbon budget in between global south and global north, that's how degrowth started. So we always need to take into account inequality. Then you realize that actually the global north is just whatever they can do while growing their economy is just much, 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 much insufficient. And so that's why for us growth critical scholars, like there is no way of squaring the equation without considering a significant decrease of production and consumption in these high income countries. I think something that we need to address is this, you know, growth critical, because it's not just about the planetary boundaries. It's also about the fact that these economic systems that have been built on infinite growth have not benefited the majority. Growth is not giving what it is purported to give. And certainly since 2008, since the global recession, what we've seen even in quote unquote developed nations as quality of life is going down, even the average life expectancy now is going down in places like the United States whilst their economy is growing. And so growth has seemed to be a, a manner of essentially a small minority skimming off the, the profits and hoarding these resources for themselves. And there was vaguely enough to go around when we were developing welfare states post-World War II, which is how we saw this boom in welfare states and living qualities in the developed nations. But that was whilst colonialism and exploitation extraction was happening elsewhere in the world. And since we've kind of brought at home since these post-colonial states have been attempting development themselves and attempting to raise the living standards and entering into the global market with a small capacity to negotiate. What we've seen is the well-being of people in developed nations uh, crash effectively. So it seems odd even that there's still this conversation around growth and wanting continued growth when it's so obviously not working apart from to line the pockets of the few which really reveals sort of the state of politics today around the world. It, it reveals the state of politics and also the, the poverty of modern economics. It's, the situation would be like a bunch of adults in a room arguing over the best way of just growing in centimeters without managing to do so, without understanding that past the age 25, 
nature does that we stop growing in centimeters. And it's not about how high you are. The difference between you being 25 and 35 and 45 and 55 is not stagnation and, you know, a disaster. If you still, you know, I'm 180 when now I'm 34, the same 180 I was when I was 24. Mm -hmm. I've changed in other ways. And so now it feels we're stuck on the wrong indicator and we're actually looking, you know, at the finger that shows the the moon is Mm. development, is how do mature economies actually start shifting from quantity, from volume, to quality, to conviviality, to all these Mm. more subtle indicators, instead of just looking at the finger, which is just GDP, so just blind monetary agitation. So right now, I think we need first to have this collective realization that, yeah, we've been for the last decade obsessing over an indicator that has lost all correlation with what should be considered true development, which is pretty consensual. Longer, healthier lives, convivial lifestyles, healthy diet, lack of poverty, relative equality, dynamic democracy, free time, all these kind of stuff that I think people want, if they're not correlated with growth, or even if the pursuit of economic growth is degrading these very often through the degradation of ecosystems, why are we inflicting ourselves that pain and inflicting ourselves is a bit too light an analysis because we're mostly inflicting that pain on vulnerable people of the world. We're already bearing the brunt of that supposedly magical economic growth we've experienced during industrial revolution, we did it come from, you know, the genius of or a few engineers that kind of invented the steam engine or whatever. It came, as you, you rightly said, from a massive appropriation of labor time, land, energy, and materials from the global south. And this is why now we must be very careful when we compare the different footprints of countries. First, we need to follow the trails as I did for France. When we look at emissions in France, we include imported emissions. That more than doubles the emissions of France. So that's significant. And then we look at emissions per capita. You cannot compare the bulk of emissions of a country like France and of a country like China. It doesn't make any sense. In the same way, you cannot compare the budget of a family of one and the budget of a family of 12. <laughs> Obviously, you know, it doesn't make sense. So emissions, footprint per capita. If we do that, we realize that there is still a huge divide between this minority world of very high carbon footprint that are living above their means and they are still monopolizing a huge chunk of the world carbon budget and a majority world of very low carbon footprint that right now do not have access to the energy and materials necessary for their own development. And worse than that, actually, are living in conditions where these access is being degraded because ecosystems are degraded or because these economies have been for decades organized around the supplying of materials and goods and services for the global north, so to feed that kind of overconsumption in the north. So that's, I think, why inequality becomes so important in that discussion. And I just wanted to mention a study because you, you talked about the US, and there was a study published in an academic journal a couple of weeks ago called Wasted GDP in the USA. Just a quick note here for your reference, I've linked the paper Wasted GDP in the USA here in the show notes of this episode. So what this scholar tried to do, basically, is to calculate how much of the American GDP is wasted in, because it does not contribute to increase life expectancy and education levels. So we're mm. looking at what we call like the non-income human development index, so just education and health. And so that study compares the U.S. to other countries and realized that 27 countries outperform the U.S. in terms of education and health with a lower GDP. So if you look at the top five performers, Greece, Spain, Slovenia, Japan, and Cyprus, these countries, they managed to beat the U.S. in terms of life expectancy and education levels with an average of 37% less GDP. Mm -hmm. So that's significant because 37% less GDP Let's say right now, if the U.S. was as efficient as Slovenia or Cyprus in terms of supplying the means of having a healthy and educated lifestyle, 
that would reduce straight away 5% of global emissions. That's what wow. 30% of wasted American GDP is. Like every year, just in the US, we emit 5% of global emissions that serves no purpose whatsoever. That is just the product of a wrong organization, like a system that is badly organized, that is very inefficient in delivering something as simple as just health and education services. That is fascinating. I mean, we're just spending our money and our money. It's not even our money. I mean, this is the thing with the community. It's like the curtain keeps falling away the more that you learn about the global economic system and especially like the degrowth theory. I've been, God, I think I first interviewed you about a year and a half ago um, and I've been working on this for a couple of years and it was only very recently that it finally That's clicked true. in my head that like wealth is natural resources and like power is the capacity to convert natural resources into personal riches. And, the, and so when we think about the economy is being so divorced from biophysical reality and economic theory being so d- divorced from the biosphere. And that's how it's come to be that we can think of the fact that billionaires exist as people having zeros in bank accounts. But every single one of those digitized zero was a, is a relative to some kind of natural resource that has been taken away from the majority, stripped from the majority, whether it's their time, their labor, the resources that were around them, whatever. And to think that all of that kind of personal extreme wealth is then also contributing to the the poly crisis that we face, 5% of global emissions. I mean, it seems very obvious that in a degrowth world or in a post-growth world, this kind of level of inequality cannot continue. So I'm assuming there would be no billionaires, right, in a degrowth world. No, and I mean, in general... The existence of billionaire is the symptom of an, eco- an economic system that doesn't work. Because, I mean, when you think about it, what is it the very purpose of an economy? Is to satisfy needs. And most especially, what is the purpose of growing an economy? Well, when your economy is not big enough, when you don't have enough productive capacities to meet the needs of all the population, which is the case in many low-income countries, you need more agitation. As you said, you need to transform natural resources into useful goods and services. So obviously, if you look at this macroeconomically, that's going to be a bigger economy. But so we understand that growth is a temporary phenomenon. You go from unmet needs to needs. Once you have the productive capacities that are sufficient to meet the needs of the whole population, there is no point continuing to build hospitals and roads every year. You already have enough. Mm. Then you switch in quality mode. But The formation of inequality, especially in a country where you have unmet needs, is very inefficient because that means a a minority gets the right and access to a lot of resources that they don't need because they don't have unmet needs. So it means you need to grow your economy just to create or actually hope to create extra stuff to eradicate poverty, whereas actually you already have enough stuff. It's an allocation problem or a production problem. This is why it's quite funny when people expect, even in a rich countries like France, economic growth to eradicate poverty. So for the last decades in France, poverty has been on the rise, which is surprising because we are supposedly one of the richest countries on earth. And if you decompose, let's say, 100 euros of economic growth, in which pockets does it go? So you have 35 euros of that extra 100 that goes in the pocket of the top 100. So these people, they don't need extra money. They're already in the top 1%. So they, let's say they're the people that are most distant from potential poverty. So then you get 32 euros that go to the next 9%. So already you have the great majority of that 100 euros being appropriated by the 10%, which, I mean, that's the logic of capitalism. It's just we reward people that were already rich that kind of invested their money. So that's the way it works, which is counterproductive in economic term if you acknowledge the fact that the economy is about need satisfaction. And then if you look at, let's say, the poorest half of the French population, so that's the kind of income you want to grow. That's the people that actually need to have access to more or better health, education, food, housing. These people, they only pocket eight euros. So basically, that round of economic growth is enriching the people that are already rich. What are they going to do with that 70 euros they've earned? 
they're going to just invest it. How are they going to invest it? For example, they're going to do what we call like housing investment. They're going to buy property in cool cities like Paris or Lyon or Bordeaux or Biarritz. And then they're going to rent it to people that don't have the means of buying their own house. And then they're going to have their wealth increasing faster than the average, which means they will reinvest their money. I mean, this logic of just wealth inequality creating an opportunity for an increase in income inequality, reinforcing wealth inequality and all, is just a vicious circle of uh, a growth that feeds inequality. So right now, like in industrial countries, like in high-income countries in general, all high-income countries, they have enough productive capacities to meet the needs of their whole population. It's just like their economic system is not efficient enough, is not fair enough, so that the sharing, the pre-distribution, the distribution, and the redistribution of all the wealth being created just end up satisfying the needs of the population. And these, the decision makers in this country keep blindly pushing the GDP button in the way like a, a, a teenage playing video games would just like, you know, refresh a page a thousand times because <laughs> your internet is stuck, you know, because your Wi-Fi is crap. That's what we do with GDP. Like refresh, refresh. I hope that GDP growth somehow is going to solve poverty, is going to solve inequality, is going to finance, you know, <laughs> it's going to avoid austerity, is going to finance innovation. I hope that's it's going to find science and all of that and solve climate change. It's not doing that. That's not what that button does. <laughs> so if you want to do this, you will have to have more sophisticated policies in order to achieve these goals. Some pushback to degrowth has been that it is uh, resource blind in the sense that even if we redistribute the the wealth in global north countries, raising the living standards of the majority world um, is going to cause ecological overshoot or worsen ecological overshoots. What would you say to that criticism? There's a first, I think, misunderstanding to diffuse is the fact that we can maintain the way of life that we have in this, what some s scholars call the imperial uh, mode of living. So basically the way Europeans live, let's say, to, to not take like an outrageous average, like the American or the, the Australians. <laughs> so we, we stabilize the way of life of the Europeans, and then we can bring everyone up to that level. That's delusional. There's, there's not enough materials, there's not enough soil. The biodiversity will not take it. It's just, it's not something that is, I think, biophysically possible to do. So we need to do what, uh, like some Australians, they've been talking about like the simpler way. It's kind of a very like low tech, low resources way of life. The people in Quebec, they call it voluntary simplicity. The UK alternative hedonism. In France, we call it uh, happy sobriety. <laughs> the mm -hmm. concept of Pierre Rabhi. Some people took off minimalism, but we have basically to simplify our needs and we have to share what we have much more so that we can actually allow ourselves to maintain quality of life while greatly reducing the amount of stuff we have and therefore the amount of stuff we produce and therefore the amount of stuff we extract from nature and therefore the amount of stuff we send back as pollution into nature. If we want basically to give a fair shot to people in the global south that will never be able to have the kind of life we have. So if you look at the top 10% of humans today that just have access to planes, remains a minority world and they just fly around, that will never be universalable. Like, that's not a word, but you, we can never <laughs> democratize that. Not every human on earth will be able to just take four, five, six flights a year. Yeah. That's not possible. So if we look at the reality of just, well, if we take all flights today, and we need to cut that by half or whatever, and then we split that by 10 billion people, well, that's not that many flights. Then if we decide, well, then there are some priority flights for emergencies and stuff, that leaves very little for tourism. So that means that we need to kind of thrive within new way of life, like the slow movement, the local tourism, these kind of stuff, finding also alternatives like night, night trains to go in faraway places for holidays, stuff like this. So you're right that we cannot, like, and, and that's a bit selfish because we in the global north, I think we had a few decades of like very fast life. We could have big cars and highways and change phones every color every year and change TVs and have billions of clothes and eat all kind of fancy animals all together for Christmas. <laughs> I, I've seen the supermarket now, I'm in France, like the foie gras is just completely insane. So people will eat like, 
oyster and lobster and foie gras, like in, with an, almost the same mouthful. Like that, that's just, if everyone had this lifestyle for a couple of years, there would be just no animals left on earth. So mm. unfortunately, or maybe not unfortunately, because that lifestyle was also, has been degrading our health mm. on top of that, the health of the ecosystems. And I'm not sure it has just increased our quality of life so much. So I think Global South right now has to be smart. And of course, it's no one to tell them, and I'm not generalizing. I'm just saying like, now nah, every country basically needs to look at quality of life. What are the things that are truly contributing to prosperity, to quality of life, truly contributing to a healthy, to a healthy, happy life. And then we need to find a way of allowing that to happen, taking into account, of course, the historical responsibility that whatever can be done in the global, that the global north will have to do a lot of effort to counterbalance all the damage that they've created. So that, for example, the loss and damage kind of finance that has started in the COP that is, I think has not gone like nowhere near what it, the kind of magnitude and level of political importance it should have today. But that's, that's what I, I would say on, on this issue of just like fairly splitting. And then I'm going to quote that sentence from the IPCC that has been going around that I think is just a nice summary of that. It's just well-being for all within planetary boundaries. Planetary boundaries, they're set. We know that. The population on Earth is pretty much set, at least for the short term. And so we have to do with that kind of ecological budget and we have to guarantee as the best we can, well-being for all. So yeah, there's going to be sacrifices. There is no, I think we, we cannot lie and say that it's all going to be happy and everyone's going to love stopping eating foie gras. Yeah, well, people love eating foie gras in France and yeah, maybe that's going to be a bit of a sacrifice to stop. But we always have to compare the small sacrifice of not being able to go shopping, or to take a, a plane in Barcelona instead of taking a train or a bus versus the inability of a family somewhere in the near future to just have access to drinkable water or doctors or basic life, decent life services. Not just in the near future, right now. And also for us in the global north or the West or the minority world whatever term you want to use, there is no doubt that if we continue, we are going to blast right through the semi-decent carbon budgets left. And quite frankly, I mean, I spent a lot of my time thinking about our food systems. It's not going to be a case, you know, if you, if you stop eating foie gras now, maybe we'll get to a place where we can feed everybody. Whereas if we continue to consume, I love how foie gras has become sort of this <laughs> metaphor for luxury, but if we continue con right. to consume foie gras, in the way that we are, um, it is fairly likely that in Europe, at least, and quite possibly in the United States, we are not going to be able to feed ourselves because our food systems are on the verge of collapse due to all of this ecological pressure with how much that we've extracted and are messing with the climate. That's completely true. I would agree to this. And so, so not we, I'm not going to take a foregore example again. <laughs> but I just wanted to focus on just those millionaires you, you talk about. And now I'm referring to another study that was recently published. And that is just look at this kind of carbon emissions of these millionaires right now. And just if you take them all together, and I mean, so that people realize millionaires in the world, let's say in US dollars, in 2020, they are about like 51 million millionaires. Okay. So that's a small crowd. Knowing that basically, if you take the 1% of humanity, usually this category is 1% is 77 million. The top 10% mm. we talked about earlier is 700 million. So millionaires is basically a bit smaller. So 50 million out within the, the top 1%. And these people, if they keep, let's say, uh, their emission increase and their share of appropriation of the global carbon budget, they will alone... There's 51 small group, a million people, they will use 72% of the 1.5 carbon budget over the next 30 years. So that's yeah. quite, it's strange. Imagine you have just one very scarce, precious resource, concentrated energy that you can use for very fast need satisfaction. Like we have a flood, we have to build back all the building, like then we can use powerful energy to do this. Or we can just use all that energy and give it to the richest people that can just waste it on 
consumption that is actually not satisfying needs in the very definition of the term. And here I'm not judging like their lifestyle being, it doesn't make them happy. I'm sure it does. It's just like from a statistical perspective, whatever they do with their energy footprint is not raising their life expectancy, their education levels is not, and is not even raising like, or not even is actually not raising general levels of well-being in the countries where these people uh, use these massive amounts of energy. Yeah, it is very much wasted resources. So let's paint an example, because there's a couple of cities in the world now that are implementing degrowth models. Now, the assumption would be it moves to renewable energy, renewables which are very ecologically pressured for the environment, but the point is to use less and less so we don't have to build out the grid as much um, as if we were to just substitute. People working less, that's another great degrowth policy. Can you walk us through kind of some examples of where it's being rolled out in the world and also the sort of dream for what a degrowth society looks like or post-growth? Yeah, so a couple of cities have published urban planning strategies using the donut theory of Kate Rayworth, which is a great framework to start to think about that big macroeconomic diet. And Amsterdam has done so, and so did Brussels. And the University of Lausanne in Switzerland has also recently published uh, a donut uh, strategy. And so when you do so, the first novelty, and that's groundbreaking, is to consider to start from the biocapacity of your ecosystems. So it's not mm -hmm. like nature becomes the first, let's say, stakeholder in your development strategy, whether you're a municipality, a company, an association, a country, or even a group of countries. You start from talking to your ecosystems and calculating their carrying capacity. What can, what is the state of nature right now? Is it healthy? What, how, how much and what is the quality of ecosystem services we have? Bird populations, insects, microorganisms in the soil, water cycles. So you look at all these very different ways that used to be completely disconnected from economics, because as you said, with economics, we're starting from, let's say, money and machines and just, you know, workers. Now we're mm -hmm. starting ahead of that. Biocapacity. That is giving a cap. In degrowth economics, biocapacity is giving you the cap. You cannot run faster than nature. So if nature says, you know, that's the maximum amount of food you can sustainably harvest from the soil you have, that's going to be your cap for consumption. Or otherwise you can cheat, use pesticides, use fossil fuels, go a bit faster than the music for a while, then you crash your soil and you will get nothing. So you're going to cheat with nature. I think that's the biggest lesson of the 20, 20th century. So you do that and then you do the same kind of inventory for needs. That's really the novelty with degrowth economics is that we're looking at biocapacity and we're matching this with need satisfaction, but not looking at euros. We don't care about growth and inflation and stuff yet. What we care is actually concrete needs decent housing, adequate diets, and food av availability. We look at needs, wh wherever these needs are in the population you're looking at. So needs being voiced by the people themselves telling you like, every day I need to drive my kids to school there, and then I need to do that. And yeah, has someone to watch my kids. And I need this kind of medicine because I've got this kind of sickness. You look at all of that, and then you ask yourself, okay, good. Now we've got the different footprints of the things we do. We know that when we build, let's say we're in Amsterdam and they wanted to build, I mean, some companies wanted to build this huge data farm. And Amsterdam realized, well, if we do this, that's going to monopolize a lot of our electricity and it's going to be massive. Do we want to do this? In all the ha like well-being footprints of everything we could do with that energy, is doing data farming with, is it really our first priority? And if we are overshooting the carrying capacity of our ecosystems right now, and so we want to decrease our total ecological footprint, do we prefer to shut down a school or a hospital or a data farm that is mostly, I don't know, like hosting porn content? <laughs> You're like, well, you know what? If I had to choose and I'm a decision maker, <laughs> I will take the lowest well-being footprint and I'm going to shut the porn data farm. And so that's basically what degrowth economics is, is, this kind of matching of matching like high, trying to target high ecological footprint activity that also have a low, relative low well-being footprint. So those can be shut down first 
and you shut these down so you can maintain and actually expand. Countries, for example, right now, they're transitioning to carless mobility. That demands the building of a lot of bike lanes if you're a city. Bike lanes, they don't appear, they don't appear magically. You need uh, concrete, you need energy, you need time, you need a lot of things to build them. These things, they won't be available if you're using already all that energy to build massive highways or new airports. So from a degrowth economics perspective, you're like, okay, guys, we want in total to use less concrete because we know that's a huge part of our footprint. So we're going to cancel that airport extension. We're going to cancel the, all these highway projects. We're going to cancel the mall extension. We're actually even going to decommission and deconstruct an airport that was only including National Airline, which we've all closed in order to reduce our carbon footprint. And we're going to use, let's say, a portion of these materials to build bike lanes. So you see, we have general lowering of the ecological footprint, even though we can have more bike lanes. Mm -hmm. And the equation, and that's the social equation we're trying to maintain, is to be like, less highway, but more bike lanes. We, want, we can increase, actually, mobility. Like, we can increase our ability to satisfy mobility needs if also we simplify the needs and we better share access. So instead of each having each household having an enormous electric car or even a non-electric car that requires so much resources, well, you know what? We're going to think urban planning so people can have access to their jobs and where they bring their kids to school without having to drive for 40 minutes on a massive highway where they feel insecure and so where they want to have a huge car to protect their kids. No, we're going to think like that city to be smaller so you can bring your kids to school where they can go together safely on the bike. And then when you simplify these needs, you realize, huh, perhaps now I don't need the car. In the same way that if you lived in Amsterdam in the 80s, well, then of course you would need a car to do anything. And I've lived in Amsterdam for a couple of years. Having a car would be a burden. I, wouldn't, I don't even mm. know where I would put it. It would just be like so annoying to have one because I can satisfy all my mobility needs with a bike, with public transport, with walking. So now we see the power of, let's say, investing in collective infrastructure so we can afford to be frugal individually in terms of extravagant fossil intense mobility needs because there's this collective infrastructure we can use. It's a beautiful vision. I think the very first time I heard about degrowth, I was completely struck by how it represents a, a better life. And it represents a lot of what people want, which is having more time to do what matters and having access to more choice. Because I think part of what this current economic system does is really reduce most people's autonomy, whether that's global South nations who are forced to engage uh, in providing low value goods and services to the global North in order to enter into the, the global market, or whether it's people who are forced into buying a car because there's no public transport around where they are. And this degrowth, post-growth life really seems to just open up the, the vestiges of possibility, which will allow then for a more diverse culture, which will allow for more creativity and imagination and put us in a stage in the future where we will be better able to respond to a crisis if it hits us because more people's like brainwaves and imagination will be freed up to think about how exactly to respond to it. And I, I think that's a, I think it's a very beautiful thing to be striving towards. It's very exciting that it's being trialed and rolled out in different places around the world. Fingers crossed we uh, do it in time. Yeah. And just to take a little example, like what we're doing right now is such a mistake based on traditional economics, because look at this, we're wasting the time of two highly educated people to engage in an activity that is not going to be lucrative. So right now in GDP terms, what we're doing is called leisure. It you know creates no value whatsoever. So let's say instead of doing that podcast, which I'm sure many people will enjoy, so it creates some kind of value, even though it's not monetized, it is mm -hmm. valuable nonetheless. It fulfills the concrete need of education, of information, even I hope of entertainment. <laughs> but from a GDP lens, from a growth economics perspective, we would have rather not done this podcast, but let's say design an ad or even work directly at McDonald's just for an hour and sell burgers and get mm -hmm. paid minimum wage. But even that, from a GDP perspective, would have been a better use of our scarce resources that is ourself in terms of need satisfaction. So now we understand 
how nonsensical it is to actually to reduce the great diversity of activities we do as humans and that the living world is doing just through the lens of lucrative capitalist money measured business. That is completely ludicrous. Like those people that are trying to estimate basically, well, the monetary contribution of bees to the economy is just oh, God. the insect are not contributing. Like mushrooms yeah. are not contributing to the economy. Like they are the living world in its all complex togetherness. And so we cannot just isolate this and put a price on it and just let a millionaire or billionaire buy it or let the central bank just create invent that amount of money, just print it out nowhere. Just that does not correspond to real value. So I think we need to accept a certain pluralism of value. And if we do this analytically, we reach, I think that like what you were describing, which is Jason Hickel call the, calls this the happy coincidence of degrowth. That what we need to do to right now preserve the health of our ecosystems, we know we need to just demand less. We need to leave them in peace. So mm -hmm. less mobilization of land, less extraction of materials, less deforestation. We need to take care of biodiversity. We need to regenerate a lot of damaged ecosystem. We need to depollute uh, water streams. We know we need to do this, but this must not necessarily be done in a state of social misery. Actually, there's this happy coincidence where doing that, slowing down the speed of our economies can also generate a lot of social benefits. First, having to do with our mental health and our sociological health. I think fast-paced economies where everyone rushes to find well-paid jobs and compete on a market basis just to earn more money so you can buy stuff you don't really need to impress other people is just... It's not fulfilling. And I'm not making a value judgment. You know, I spend some of my days reading studies from psychologists, from anthropologists, from sociologists looking at this. And they're telling us, you know, you can read like Kate Supper, Post Growth Living, just summarizes that research very well. That's not making us happy. So I think, for example, just producing and consuming less. So this macroeconomic diet, one of the first outcome of that is that we will be able to reduce the average working time. People, when you say this, a politician freaks out. They're like, oh my God, that's unemployment. No, reduction of working time means liberation of free time. That's a good thing. That's what an economy should do. Over time, a, an economy that is performant, that works well, should liberate time for you to do whatever you want. Podcast, learn the, few, the flute, go and just pick up trash on the beach. Uh, spend time with your dogs or whatever you want. That's <laughs> autonomous time. That's the real reward of efficient economic organization. So right now, again, like this focus on full employment, which is just basically the system we have of just trying to just people having them satisfy their needs only through being paid very low wages in this tedious work. Whereas again, if we had a more equitable system of this distribution of wealth, we could live simpler lives with much more free times on our hands, which I think will just chill everyone and makes life much more pleasant and of course, more sustainable. Yeah, I completely agree with you and that vision. And the thing is as well, when, and this has been, I think it was Jason Huckle who speaks about this. We know that when you increase that quality of life, when you give people more free time, they then do quite naturally spend less money. They naturally consume less stuff and consume more of their loved ones or of their own time or whatever it is. So we know that there's this correlation between how much we are overproducing and overconsuming in this economy and our negative mental health. And so this thing of liberating humanity, it turns out if we're liberated, we do quite naturally live more sustainably. Like we are wired for slower, happier lives that do better for the planet as well because i mean we've focused on the the human aspect of this and material aspect and economic aspect but as you said with the donut model the nature becomes the first stakeholder this is exactly what we need to do as well to as you said leave our ecosystems alone because they're not ours as well we are part of them leave the planet alone so that she can regenerate so that she can be well so that we can share this planet with 
all of the diverse things that were here, some of them long before us. And this is why it's so important to just take that debate even beyond economics. This is a legal matter. So all these discussions on the intrinsic right of nature to exist mm -hmm. and bringing ecosystems as entities, legal entities in our constitutions. Uh, and in even like, you know, the universal declaration of rights, like to broaden this, not only to humans, but just to the living world and all living organisms. As soon as you do this, it's a whole different discussions because, yeah, nature, a river, a mountain, a forest becomes a legal entity that is entitled to live a healthy life, to have its own. Of course, a healthy life for a forest is not the same standards as us, you know, in terms of free time and inclusions in democratic <laughs> participation. They have their own way of being healthy. And we know what that looks like. You know, it looks like a forest that is just not massively dying. Uh, so. We know what healthy looks like for ecosystems. And if we include this in our legal code, which is basically our societal software, then we can protect this by being like, guys, no. Like we, our economies, can only work in synergies with the living world. Obviously, everything we do requires energy and materials. So we don't dance together with nature, whether we want it or not. But we need to dance at our own speed. And That's, I think, what we, lear we must learn to do in these fast-paced societies. And just an example of what you said earlier about kind of vicious circle of overwork in a job you don't like that leads you to very like intense modes of living. And some of my friends, they have jobs that I consider to be counterproductive. Let's say they work in advertising. If you work in mm -hmm. advertising... Society creates more value when you're on holiday than when you work, because what you work, what you create is actually disvalue. Every hour you put in is creating more social and ecological costs than the benefits that you derive from it. So the whole sector of advertising should be shut down, but you know, of course that's difficult to do. So these people, they overwork. So they go and pull like 40, 50, 60 hour work week, overstressing, burning themselves out just to give their time to design ads that no one needs and they are just polluting our internet and public transport and all of that. These people, they do this until they feel so bad about themselves, not because they feel guilty, just because they feel tired, because they cannot take the yarky at work anymore. And so they feel something special to regenerate themselves. Very often, like in our Western uh, privileged culture, that takes the form of buying a plane ticket to go very far. Like, I'm going to go and do yoga in India for a month. That's really what I need to find myself. And then you're like, mm -hmm. geez, you could have found yourself by just not working too much, spending more time in your garden here, talking to your neighbors, spending time with your children. You would have been happy. Then you would have never mm -hmm. felt the need to do this, you know, this kind of like eat, pray, love journey, like nonsense. Whereas actually, so now there's a, also a very co-benefit for these people. Stop destroying the planet and actually you will, you will realize that life can be a pretty sweet with it, this simpler way of living where you're in the same way that you're not growing in kilos and centimeters, but you're growing in experiences. Like the very fact of growing your own garden, like mm -hmm. some people that are like, oh, that's peasant stuff. We emancipated from that. That's middle age kind of leisure. I think many people and me, Like the first, like coming from a peasant family, but being the latest generation not to work on the farm where now we feel like, oh, we're above peasantry because finally we have access to other jobs. Like the very fact of deciding autonomously to grow my own food is just bringing a certain source of pleasure and a lot of knowledge of the living world. And so I think here, I don't want to romanticize this, but it's about having the option. So for example, if we were to better share access to land, There's a real inequities concerning land ownership right now. Mm -hmm. So that everyone have access to a shared garden where they can grow food or just lay in the grass and watch butterflies and do whatever they want. I think that option is very valuable. And mm -hmm. in places where that's being studied, we see that when people take on that options, they actually enjoy it. It reduces the level of stress. It grows like this ecological sympathy. The more time you spend with nature, the more you're able to understand that, oh, wow, I haven't have to spend time in my garden. I understand what's coming to the soil. So I don't want this to happen to someone other garden somewhere else. So I'm not going to consume food that I know has been grown unsustainably, even though that's 
elsewhere in another country and not here. So muscling up this ecological sympathy is so important if we want to truly consider nature like a stakeholder, like someone that speaks in our democracies. Nature today, nature tomorrow, nature yesterday. And nature and all the various life forms that it has at many different levels of complexity is are just so much more complex than the kind of decisions making we have, we have within our relatively simpler democratic systems. I completely agree with you. And even just to push it one step further to wrap up, not just nature then as stakeholder, but also us as nature. Because this is this thing, but this binary between man and human. We talk about going into nature and spending time with nature and we forget that we are nature. We are natural creatures. We are biological creatures. We are organisms. We are as, <laughs> some of us are as important to the ecosystem as anything else. In some places of the world, humanity is a keystone culture for natural ecosystems because they are part of it and they steward it. And it seems to me that this capacity that we have for like, collective organizing and conceptualizing and discussing and language. I mean, we could be these incredible stewards as part of nature of the rest of nature. We could be this really wonderful species that takes care of everything around us and of each other. And it seems to me that is what we could put all of this intellectual capacity we have to really good work, really valuable work. And I hope one day, I hope one day that's where we get to. That's beautiful. Could not agree more. And I've got nothing to add. I think that's a, a beautiful conclusion to that conversation. <laughs> oh, well, Tim, thank you so much for your time. This was just truly excellent. I really appreciate it and all of your work. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, that was fun. Pleasure. So I was just mentioning this to you, Rachel, but this is one of my favorite interviews that you've given. I, it was really it was a really fascinating discussion and a really detailed, clear explanation of what degrowth actually is. And I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of misunderstanding about what degrowth is. And I think that you and Tim covered that really well here. Oh, thank you, Mike. Tim did like all of the legwork. He's just such a phenomenal communicator. I would, I'd hate to come up against him in a debate. <laughs> That's too big a brain <laughs> with too much information. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, uh, he had so many good insights to say. One analogy that really stuck out to me is that he compared in the, the idea of focusing on GDP as like how we measure the well-being of a society as sort of like measuring a person's height as being the well-being of a person. Obviously, we don't continually measure our height past the age of 25 and go, this is a definitive indicator of your growth because that's silly. Our growth plates fuse around the age of 25 and we stop growing. And there's other ways we can measure that growth. Mm. So I thought the analogy he used there was actually really cool. And it was a great way to describe what degrowth actually focuses on. It's a point that I've used time and again already in my conversations since recording that with Tim, because I think the whole point of degrowth is trying to like highlight the inaccuracies of measuring a well-being economy using GDP. And yet so many people forget that that means that isn't what degrowth's doing. It's not about a forced recession. It's not about diminishing people's access to GDP or the measurement of GDP or whatever. It's throwing GDP out the window and be like, no, 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 we've got much better things that we can use to measure our well-being and our capacity, namely the planetary boundaries. So how about we keep within those to, to begin with? Right. And this is really applicable to the conversation that you just had with Hannah Ritchie, because Tim talks about this in the interview. And I, I'm either making a note about that for the listeners or I'm, or I'm going to edit this so that I just talk about it here. But Tim mentioned a study called Wasted GDP in the USA. And I actually reviewed this study. It's published in Nature while I was producing the episode with Hannah. And I was like, oh, Tim's mentioning it here. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to state a couple of facts here for our listeners so that they know what this study Please. means and what Tim was talking about. So the study begins, it tells the reader a thought experiment. It says, if Portugal, and I'm reading word for word here, if Portugal has higher levels of human welfare than the United States, with $38,000 less GDP per capita, then we can conclude that $38,000 of America's per capita income is effectively, quote, wasted. 
that adds up to $13 trillion per year for the US economy as a whole. That's $13 trillion worth of extraction and production and consumption each year, and $13 trillion worth of ecological pressure. That adds nothing in and of itself to the fundamentals of human welfare. It is damage without gain. This means that the US economy could, in theory, be scaled down by a staggering 65% from its present size, while at the same time, improving the lives of ordinary Americans if income was distributed more fairly and invested in public goods. And I feel like that was the that was essentially the point that Tim was making. And in the conclusion of this article, it says this, rich countries can improve welfare from today's levels, even in steady state degrowth scenarios. If economic downscaling is combined with much more equal sharing, frugality and efficiency, with the latter implying squeezing more life support and want satisfaction from a given throughput. This would mean prioritizing policies that evidently promote well-being over policies that are detrimental to social or environmental circumstances. And I just wanted to point out that sort of runs counter to what Hannah Ritchie was claiming, which is that we need to continually grow things in order to improve human well-being. This study is saying otherwise, and it's explaining how. Yes, I'm really glad we're doing this back to back with Hannah. And I think ideally it'd be great to get Hannah and Tim in a room and, and hear them discuss all of these things. I think exactly as you say, not only with his argument, but with the sources that he cites, he really lays out how limited that is as a, as a viewpoint, um, as a discussion point, as a measurement tool, essentially. And I think, Tim, I remember interviewing somebody years ago and a really great economist called Blair Fix. And he explained GDP to me through the sort of telling the story of Hurricane Katrina. And he said, after Hurricane Katrina, a huge amount of money was spent like rebuilding, essentially. And all of that money was then counted to GDP. And so like local and regional GDP went up. And so it was a more successful year than the year before. Mm hmm. And I was like, that's, that's crazy. That's madness. A community has just experienced a hurricane. People have lost their lives. They've lost their properties. They've lost their memories. They've been displaced. And it was a bit of a disaster trying to rebuild as well afterwards. But none of that was taken into consideration. Just the fact that money was spent responding to disasters. And at that moment, I was like, well, gosh, how dangerous. I mean, if you're not differentiating between the kind of money that you're spending in response to what situation then how on earth can you tell whether anything is in fact positive or negative? And to me, that really just revealed the, the fallacy, like that a dollar spent is the same everywhere, no matter what. Well, no, evidently not. And I'm really glad to see these studies now coming out on this idea of wasted GDP. I mean, they did it with reference Portugal. Be fascinating to see it with Cuba as well, right? A country that has been hit with economic sanctions, but still has a higher quality of life. People live longer and higher well-being than the United States and is much poorer than Portugal. Cuba does indeed have a higher life expectancy than the United States, according to multiple sources. Depending on the source, it varies, but the United States ranks just below Uruguay and French Polynesia, according to the CIA World Factbook, landing in 72nd place. Rachel asserted here Cuba has a higher quality of life than the United States. And this is also true according to the UN's own findings that measure the quality of life of ordinary citizens, specifically in 2022, when taking into account sustainable development goals and other factors that measure equality and democracy. The US ranked ahead of Bulgaria in 41st place, but behind Cuba. These rankings have since shifted, though. Other sources, such as the Human Development Index, ranks the US in 21st place, quite far ahead of Cuba but still far below the top five, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Hong Kong, and Australia. Yeah, I, I mean, Tim actually mentioned that there were a lot of con countries that sort of outperformed the US. Actually, you were mentioning this too, and I actually cited a couple studies in the last episode about countries that outperformed the United States on quality of life factors, the like human development index. And this study, the wasted GDP one, I'm going to double check on this, but it says that it currently ranks, the Human Development Index currently ranks the USA as number 21. When it first started, when the Human Development Index was first started in 1990, the US is ranked as number one. So anecdotally, having, wow. being someone who, who lived in the United States from the years of the 1980s, I'm sort of, sort of dating myself here. 
um, through the 1980s to the 2020s, <laughs> I actually noticeably felt things decay. So I think that that is, yeah. an, I think that was an interesting metric that the study pointed out. If, if I may throw a bit of a wild card in here at this moment, I think that people's lived experience of the economy, i.e. what is happening to their lives rather than as an abstract thing that economists discuss mm -hmm. on the six o'clock news is really, really critical because it explains the sort of resurgence in like strong men candidates and leadership. Obviously, there's a huge amount of money being funded, funneled towards these kinds of candidates to get them in. Like it was the Atlas Network that got in Argentina's new leader. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But it reveals the fact that people are not living the life that the GDP quota says that they should be. People are living lives around the developed worlds that are increasingly going downhill, as you say, in terms of quality. And that's not just in the United States. In the United Kingdom, the dissent has been palpable. In France, they've had their social security ripped away. And there's been countries like Greece that never recovered from the 2008 financial crash because they simply weren't helped, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And all around the Western world as well, people are getting priced out of where they grew up uh, to live so that the wealthy can increase this um, economic divide and benefit and profit from the increasing poverty um, of uh, a lower class, essentially. And that means everyone now who isn't a millionaire, essentially. Um, and it's very, very important, I think, when we're talking about this thing to also bear in mind, this is not an apolitical discussion. It can never be an apolitical discussion because these results, these like economic realities always result into political realities as well around the world, which is a disaster for the ecological crisis. Because yeah. none of these candidates are showing any kind of understanding of the ecological crisis or a desire to respond to the ecological crisis in a way that prioritizes well-being, both of human beings and of planet and of the more than human world, which is what we need at this point. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on, Rachel. And I think one of the ways in which the kind of human connection to the environment and the politics of that shows up immediately is in housing. And it's a critical mm. human resource, right? We all need a place to stay and live. And it's also tied to how we use land. It's tied to materials and, and, and all these other resources that we need. And if that commodity becomes increasingly expensive and out of reach for people, so you need policy to correct that, right? Like, of course, you need to build more houses, mm -hmm. but it matters where and how those houses are built. Single family zoning only policies in the United States, for example, have had pretty detrimental environmental effects. The ever outward suburban sprawl mm -hmm. rather than the densification of, of cities has indeed put more stress on the environment and pushed those ecological boundaries. Yeah. And so those are the things that I think that sometimes people don't think about the, the political connection there. Um, but it's very strong. And I think it's in a sense understandable because as you say, housing is a critical need. It is a fundamental human right, but shelter is also something we are biologically hardwired to to seek out. And so it's difficult to unpick like the political abstractions of housing and policy to the desire for a, a home in which you can live or your family can live or your loved ones can live or whatever, something that will be yours. Mm -hmm. um, and so because typically cities have done so badly when it comes to like the integration of nature and the integration of green spaces and the provision of other kinds of needs, then you can understand why people are also responding to this urban sprawl like, oh, that's what I want to get in on because suburban sprawl, sorry. Because I would like to have some green space. I would like to have a garden. I would like to like, be able to see some trees from my window. I would like to have what feels like a safe neighborhood for my children to grow up in. Like these right. are all, like people are scrambling to fulfill really basic human needs because of a failure in long-term policy thinking that gr fails to grasp the big picture that mm -hmm. every action we take has consequences. Agreed. Yeah, it's a really good point. Tim, Tim brought up um, something in the conversation saying that we can, and one of the ways he talks about how we can actually scale back our lives in terms of how much stuff we accumulate and stuff we produce and consume is to take the infrastructure we have and mm -hmm. use it efficiently, right? So if we, ha if we live in, a, in an 
uh, a metro urban area, for example, take public transportation, for example, reduce the use of the car. And I agree with him, these are all good things. And I understand that cities are, some of them are increasing that walkability. But I also, I also wanted to note that this is a really challenging thing to do, particularly in a place like the United States or Australia, where the, the infrastructure is different than, say, that of Europe, where in Europe, the, the existing infrastructure, at least initially, it was built around walking and, and, and carts, right? It wasn't built around the automobile. Mm -hmm. But in the US, it's, it's built around the automobile. And so you have to, in some ways, deconstruct what has already been built to build a new. Not always, of course, it's, it's a, there's more gray area here. But it's a different kind of problem, I think, than the problem that you would face in, say, Amsterdam. There's very few places in the United States like Amsterdam or even a, a far cry of it. So I think that it's a really a massive challenge. I think obviously it's something that needs to happen, but it, it does give me, it does worry me about the scale of that and our ability to do it swiftly. <laughs> the thing that I find so funny around that, right? is that what's the problem, guys? It would add loads to your GDP locally if you <laughs> tore down the city and built a new one. Yeah, GDP winners. Uh, yeah. Oh, God, that's such a great, that's such a great way to, to circle this back. Uh, you're right. You know, what, but it, I feel like that's like a lot of like, like the green revolution is like jobs. Everyone loves jobs. So like, oh, we're going to build mm -hmm. lots of solar panels and wind turbines. Jobs, jobs, jobs. But I think it's, it's also more complex than that. I also thought it was funny that Tim Tim made a really valid point. He said that ideally in a world, we shouldn't be making this podcast. We'd be doing something more useful with our time. <laughs> and he's, yeah. I, I think guys disagree with him that you two working a shift at McDonald's would have been a more valuable use of your time than this podcast. Just going to disagree with that, <laughs> which is what he implied. <laughs> but I get well, what he's I saying. Think what he's saying yeah. is like under capitalism, then it would be. Because him and I making this, him and I making this like fairly creative, a bit abstract, just chatting into a microphone, like spreading ideas has no productive value under capitalism. Whereas selling our labor for an hour at McDonald's has a productive value under capitalism. Right. So I like it as an analogy. I think it's, I think it's really helpful to reveal like just how ideologically void capitalism is. Right. I think I, that, thank you for fleshing out that point a little bit more. And like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Ideally, we would be doing things for the more intrinsic value of it rather than just the dollar for dollar value yes. of it. And I, in my own mind, I imagine a world more will redo more of that. And I feel like sometimes Let's... people paint it as being too naive or altruistic. Let's do that right now, Mike. Let's 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 do a little imagination exercise right now. Imagine we okay. live in a degrowth world. Okay? okay. It's 2030. No, closer. It's 2027. It's a degrowth world. We've implemented it. We're staying within the planetary boundaries. Nobody is having to work just for a dollar value anymore. Everybody is provided with their needs. People have the choice to go out and do what they want. You wake up in this like beautiful degrowth life. What do you do with your day? What brings you the most intrinsic value? Wow. <laughs> mm. <laughs> wow uh you're really putting me on the spot here rachel i love this question Sorry. so great <laughs> i think my answer is a little personal like it not not like in sure. an inappropriate way but i think that i not sure if i want to entirely spill the beans of my soul but i i do imagine myself mm -hmm. i'll just say this i imagine myself doing something creative with my time that i have yeah. a passion about which is very much what I'm doing right now, but it could mean also other things in addition. And there's certainly many like interests and pursuits I have that I currently probably don't have the time to pursue because of money that I would probably mm -hmm. pick up and do as well. Yeah. Such a great question. Yeah. Well, it's something I like to think about quite a lot, speaking with my friend about it. And we were joking around like, hopefully one day my platform will be called like Planet Happy planet everything worked out <laughs> planet we're okay guys <laughs> i like that last one the best planet we're okay guys that's a really good one <laughs> yeah i mean fingers crossed like that's that's what we're all putting our energy into getting towards and 
Then the question becomes like, okay, does planet we're okay guys exist? Does it need to exist anymore? Like what would I do with my time? And I think I like, I'm happy to be personal. And I think last year I finally like really gave myself permission to be like very, very happy, even in a very frightening and broken world. Cause I realized that like, wow, even if the world was totally okay. And even if I had all the resources available, I would still do this. Like Mm -hmm. speaking with amazing people, sharing ideas, writing, researching, yada, yada, yada. Like that's the dream. And here I am like living that intrinsic value and it feels so, so special. And to me, when I think then of degrowth, that's why I imagine. And so I want like everybody to have that. (laughs) I want everyone to be able to picture that beautiful day in the life of like an ecologically safe and bountiful world and creatively abundant. And be like, that's what we're heading towards. Let's make it personal. This isn't just about planetary boundaries. It's not just about chucking out GDP and hitting the neoliberal economists over the head with their absolute nonsense. It's also about you and your life and your choices and your vision and the right you have to an imagination and the right that you have to a peaceful, meaningful life. Wow. Wow. That was beautiful, Rachel. That was beautiful. (laughs) I think I would still be doing this too. We do have to wrap it up. Again, great, great conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed this one. And I would I I think other people are really gonna love this conversation as well. So thank you, Rachel. Oh, I hope so. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking with Tim. He's a phenomenal speaker. If anyone wants to hear more of him, he is everywhere on the internet. And I would highly recommend it. He there's always nuggets of gold in what Tim has to say. It was a pleasure speaking with him. All right. I'll see you on the next one, Rachel. Thank you, Mike. See you on the next one. If you'd like to read more on Patrick's work, please find more information by clicking on the links in the show notes. As always, if you're enjoying the Manga Bay newscast or any of our podcast content like our sister series, Manga Bay Explores, and you want to help us out, we encourage you to spread the word about the work we're doing by telling a friend. Word of mouth is still the best way to help expand our reach like, share, and subscribe. But as always, you can support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Mongabay. Mongabay is a nonprofit news outlet, and even just a dollar per month does make a difference and helps us offset the production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com forward slash Mongabay to learn more and support the Mongabay newscast and all of our podcast content. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the Manga Bay Newscast well over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either App Store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And you can also read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com, or you can follow us on social media. Find Manga Bay via our accounts on LinkedIn at Manga Bay News or on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Facebook, and TikTok, where our handle is at Mongabay, or on YouTube at Mongabay TV. Thanks as always for listening.